Hello again and welcome back uh, from the break. This is stage one and we have API management, API design and security again, related and topics back, here. Uh, from the break. And this we have some and we have echo management. here. Sorry about that if you heard some. Okay, so we have first this um, interesting talk um, on serverless bots in a blink by Rachel White. Come on on stage, Rachel. So you are, hello, and you're a technical evangelist at Datadog and straight to us from New York. So uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the very uh, wintry Helsinki, as you can see behind me. And I hope you, that you're ready to go with your presentation, Rachel. I'm ready. Perfect, so take it away. Thank you so much. Hi, um, hi, and welcome to Serverless Bots in a Blink. My name is Rachel White. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog. I'm a full stack engineer, but my specialty is Node.js and creative coding. If you have any additional questions outside of this talk after the Q&A, please feel free to reach out to me at OHO on Twitter. And so today we're going to go over a few different items, including what's the difference between traditional and serverless applications, learning about Twitter bots, coding and generative art, serverless applications, specifically using AWS Lambda, and we'll learn how to monitor their serverless application we'll be building. And so let's start off with what exactly is serverless. And to start, we need to understand where we're at with a traditional application architecture. Traditional web applications have what we often refer to as stacks. And these stacks typically consist of an operating system, a server, a database, and a programming language. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP is a LAMP stack. Mac OS, Apache, MySQL, and PHP is a MAMP stack. Mongo, DB, Express.js, Angular, and Node is mean. And JavaScript API is JavaScript APIs and markup is Jamstack, which is a fairly new name for a more simple approach to web applications. And these are apps that have 100% uptime. You can configure your own server and have full control, control over what versions of whatever technologies you're working with. And we refer to these kinds of apps as monoliths usually because they're typically controlled via a single deployment. Um, it means we can also have quick minimum viable product, but it also means it's harder for us to change a piece of our application architecture as nothing is isolated isolated and lots of things rely on each other. An improvement on the traditional architecture is microservices. And microservices, uh, a microservices environment, everything is separate and relates to a specific feature. You can mix technologies by choosing suitable programming languages and frameworks for each service. This allows for better scalability and each service can be scaled independently according to its traffic. And also each feature is deployed separately. But with serverless, the cloud provider you choose runs your code, and you don't have to think about configuring servers at all, which is lovely. Um, you only pay for what you use, so you aren't paying the cost that you would normally incur with a server running 24-7. It's also easier to adapt at scale by having technologies automatically scale with demand. So we're specifically talking about AWS Lambda for our serverless functions today. And you can run code for virtually any type of application or backend service, all with zero administration. Just upload your code as a zip file or a container image, and Lambda automatically and precisely allocates compute execution power and runs your code based on the incoming request or event for any scale of traffic. So now that we know what we're working with, let's talk about how we can monitor those serverless environments. Our main problem that we're trying to solve is how are we going to debug a server that doesn't exist? How can we take traditional observability practices and adapt it to a serverless ecosystem? Modern infrastructure isn't simple at all. It's not just a server or two for our applications. There are many processes to look at. So how do you debug a server that doesn't exist in this ecosystem? And serverless has very platform specific constraints that you have to think about. You need to think about it in terms of how much memory do we want to allocate, which we do in regular applications, but with serverless, we have to consider that for each request that comes through. We have to deal with cold starts, which happen when you execute an inactive function. The delay comes from your cloud provider provisioning your selected runtime container and then running your function. And we have to deal with API gateways as intermediaries. So there's an API gateway or a queue, and then that calls your serverless application. 
Every year, Datadog has done a state of serverless or a state of containers where we dive into the data to see what kind of usage we're seeing within our customers. And we found that half of AWS users have adopted Lambda, which tells us that there's no doubt that there are cases and business value for using serverless. So how are we going to see that our serverless functions are working as intended? And Datadog makes it really easy. The first part is enabling our AWS integration. The AWS integration sets up, sets up some IIM roles and begins scraping your AWS account for information about what's going on within your AWS infrastructure. And then we add in the forwarder, which is going to ship all the metrics for serverless back to Datadog. And finally, we instrument with our programming language. And once you've done your initial initial instrumentation, the first thing you'll get out of the box are some metrics and a dashboard. The metrics and the dashboard give you a base to begin to rationalize about what is happening within your serverless applications. And in this case, we're looking at this dashboard and there's a couple things that stick out. Base level, how many invocations of my serverless functions do I have? How many errors? How many cold starts? Having this around lets you see um, the base level for your systems and be aware of when something fundamentally changes and when there may be something going on in your application that warrants some attention. So in addition to that, let's look at some other items. Errors are obvious to look at, slowest Lambda functions, top invoked functions, and top cold starting functions. Um, you're also able to see most expensive, most expensive functions, um, which you're able to see what is costing the most to execute within your ecosystem. And all of these are going to give you a baseline to dig deeper into some items of what you'd want to optimize. And so out of the box things with serverless instrumentation, one of the things that you get is the serverless infrastructure tab. And it's another way to think about all of the serverless functions that we have that exist at a high level. So invocations, errors, how long things are taking, all of these point to costs, application performance, and general trends. And within each of these, we can think about the serverless applications we have and pinpoint where there might be some problems or bottlenecks in our deployment. Uh, APM has language level instrumentation for serverless applications, and it's one of the biggest benefits you can get out of monitoring your software. APM allows you to see your software as services instead of focusing on it as a thing that runs somewhere. You can focus on it as a service that runs somewhere and is delivering a simple thing. So with this screenshot, we're looking at a trace that came in through AWS Lambda, and you can see the darker green, which is the Lambda being called. Above that is the top level span that is an API gateway calling that Lambda. And earlier we talked about serverless applications only existing for like a few hundred milliseconds, and it's not even called directly, it's called by something else. So distributed traces and APM give us a way to ration about that entire unit of work and all of the things that happen within it. So we can see the original API gateway call, the sub call to our Lambda, along with the status code, request ID, and the trace ID. And below the AWS Lambda, you can see that there are logs attached to it. So you can see logs across the entire request across platforms. It's a super powerful tool in reasoning about what may be happening within your software platform. One of the biggest strengths for Datadog is the ability to do traces, logs, and metrics across all platforms. And in this case, it's another trace, which is another piece of APM. It's a request that originally came through a Ruby on Rails application. And right at the orange, it calls an API gateway. That API gateway calls a Lambda. And there's actually another Lambda that is happening in the EU. And by having a single place to think about software as services and software as systems that interconnect, Datadog gives you a way to jump up and down abstraction layers. We're using multiple platforms in a single request, and we're, we're able to drop down into each one of the specific subdomains for each platform. It's a very powerful way to think about the systems when you have those diverse platforms deployed. And then for logs, Datadog's Lambda layer automatically forwards CloudWatch logs to the forwarder, which then pushes them to Datadog. So the forwarder can send logs and other telemetry to your account, such as Amazon S3 events and Amazon Kinesis data stream events. Deploying the forwarder via cloud formation is recommended as AWS will then automatically create the Lambda function with the appropriate role. Add Datadog's Lambda layer and create relevant tags like function name, region, and account ID, which you can then use Datadog to search your logs. Because the forwarder is a Lambda function, it relies on triggers to execute. So you can let Datadog automatically set up these triggers for you, or you can manually set them up to forward data as soon as they are added to S3 buckets or CloudWatch log groups. And then once configured, Datadog's Lambda forwarder will begin sending logs from Lambda and any other AWS services you've configured to your Datadog account. 
So now that we know how to handle our serverless environments, let's learn more about what we're using to build out our functions and how we're setting that up. So we're going to talk about the actual application part before um, we even talk about the specific code. Um, we'll be using something called serverless framework for our function. Uh, it has a Node.js AWS template so we can get started very quickly. It lets you develop infinitely scalable pay per execution serverless applications. A single configuration file allows you to list your functions uh, and define the endpoints that they're subscribed to. It provides structure, automation, best practices out of the box, allowing you to focus on building sophisticated event-driven serverless architectures comprised of functions and events. It has support for all major cloud providers and the serverless framework CLI provides a single cross provider developer experience. So you can write once, deploy many, that kind of thing. And then for specific AWS services, we'll be using Lambda functions, an S3 bucket to store our generative images in case we would like to use them later, and a Cloudflare cron trigger for executing our function. On the Datadog side, we'll be using the Datadog AWS integration, the Datadog Lambda forwarder, and also integrating AWS X-Ray for distributed tracing through our function. For our actual function, we'll be creating it with Node.js, and this is just a matter of personal preference. You can choose whichever language is your favorite. We'll be using Canvas to create generative art that we're making based off of color palettes that we get from the Color Lovers API. And after the images are created, we'll save them back to an S3 bucket with the AWS SDK in case we want to get non-compressed versions of them later. And lastly, we'll use Twit, which is an API client for Node that allows us to interact with the Twitter API to upload media and construct a tweet. So lastly, I want to tell you a little bit about um, some background for Twitter bots. There used to be very popular a few years ago before Twitter made it that you had to apply for a developer account in order to have access to their API. Um, there are two kinds of bots. Some are generative image bots. There are others that are just text-based, either tweeting out random words from mashed together uh, like sections or Markov chaining data from various corpora. Uh, it was a great way for people who may or may not be exceedingly technical to get their hands on some code and try things out. And people also made a lot of tools that made it even easier for people to accomplish the art that they wanted to. So I'm going to tell you about a few of my favorite bots so you kind of get an idea of what the serverless bot we're building is. Um, and then resources if this is something that you would like to try on your own. So first up is a bot called Soft Landscapes. Uh, it's an image bot made by V21 on Twitter. It uses something called Tracery, which is a tool to generate language and text. But bot developers realized that they could use its structure to replace elements in SVG, which enabled a lot of flexibility with creating generative images. Um, it's just really pretty. It's a nice bot. Tweets out Soft Landscapes four times a day. I love it. And the second is Bracket Meme Bot, which is made by Darius Kazemi, who's a super prolific Twitter bot maker. And he thankfully documents mostly everything he makes. Bracket Meme Bot takes random categories of items from Wikipedia that meet a certain set of guidelines where, you know, they must have a plural noun in the title and it must have at least 16 pages. Once it finds those categories that meet the requirements, it picks 16 of them at random and draws them on the bracket. Uh, it's very silly and you end up with brackets like SpongeBob SquarePants video games and underground laboratories. I picked one from Darius because he also keeps a GitHub uh, repository of a lot of corpora that a lot of bot makers pull from, which I'll link you to in the next slide in case you'd like to try building some yourself. So if you're interested in learning more about the tools used to make those bots, as well as other information on bot making in general, these links are a great place to start. Tracery.io, CheapBotsDoneQuick.com, GitHub.com slash DariusK slash Corpora, and BotWiki.org. And so now that we know that the tools that we're, that we're using, let's get into the setup and code of our bot. So um, I'll be talking about these things under the assumption that you already have all of the tools needed installed in your system. Um, that way I don't have to walk through, you know, installing Node, installing serverless and all of those things. So the first thing that we're going to do is navigate to the folder that we want to use for our code and run serverless create dash dash template uh, AWS dash Node.js. This is going to have the serverless framework set up a node template that's already compatible with what AWS is looking for. And we've got two files that are important, the handler.js, which we where we write our bot code, and the serverless YAML file, which is defining our provider, production environment, and other variables. 
We've got to change the service name in serverless.yaml um, to something that is relevant to our application and also change the name of the function and the handler if you'd like. Um, however, if you change the function's name in serverless.yaml, you will need to make sure that it reflects the name in module exports as well. And now we can run SLS deploy, which is short for serverless deploy. And this will take all of our files, zip it up, and deploy it to AWS. Next, you're going to log into your AWS console and navigate to the Lambda dashboard and click on the service that has the name that you chose in the previous step so that we can make sure that everything is correct, uh, connected correctly. Since we can now see that everything is hooked up, I'm going to focus on coding our bot. I'm not going to explain my line code for code. Instead, just tell you how it functions. You can grab the code from github.com slash Rachel Nicole slash color glimpse. Um, the way that our bot works is we're grabbing a color palette from colorlovers.com's API, saving it as an array. And once we have that array, we're creating some random generative lines based off of the palette, creating a PNG of that image, and saving the PNG to uh, Amazon's S3. We're constructing a tweet using the name of the palette, the palette author that we also got from the API. And then we're sending it up to Twitter so that it tweets the message in the art like this every 12 hours. So the next thing that we need to do is set up a trigger for when the bot runs. Uh, clicking on add trigger from your main Lambda function page will take us to the configuration. You can choose CloudWatch events and it will walk you through the process of setting up a rule. We created one called tweeting, which will run our function every 12 hours. You can set this up to run as frequently or as infrequently as you want. And that's it for the functionality. Now you just have to instrument the bot. We've already described the process earlier about how with one click you can set up your AWS instrumentation. So I will assume that you've already done that. Out of the box, you'll be getting some logs already. So now we just need to add a little bit more to our code. The first thing that we'll need to do is add some more information to our serverless.yaml file. Our serverless plugin has a configuration option that you can use as needed for your specific use cases. You'll need to add your Datadog API key here. And then in addition to the serverless plugin, we're also going to add uh, AWS X-Ray, which lets developers trace distributed applications built using AWS products. So for that, we're gonna head back to our handler.js file. And then you can just run npm install aws-xray-sdk and require it in your Lambda function first because you want to catch everything that happens after it's already been included. Um, we add in the code for capturing all HTTP and HTTPS traces, as well as capturing chain promises, which is super important since so much, so much of Node.js is promise-based. And then we're going to run SLS deploy one last time so our instrumentation is fully reflected in our serverless function. And that's all we really have to do for our specific use case. So now that we're fully instrumented, let's take a look at our monitors. Keep in mind that this example would be a singular function that would typically exist in a much, much larger, larger ecosystem. So um, there's going to be less for us to look at. Um, but we can see our traces, which we can dig into each individual request and see a flame graph here of all of our API calls. You can see the initial attempt happens and then we're making the connection to the Color Lovers API. And then after that, it's putting it into the S3 bucket. And then after that, there's that upload call to Twitter where it sends out the tweet or where it uploads the image to the tweet. And then lastly, it, uh, it sends the tweet out. Um, we can also see all of the tags, metrics, and logs for each specific request, which are at the bottom of the screen. And like I said, this is obviously a very small example, but I'm still able to get all of this information from just using our AWS integration and a few lines of code. So now I can go in and if this was a larger system, I would be able to pinpoint problem areas and be able to close the product feedback loop, feedback loop with teams when I see areas for improvement. So that is, uh, you know, simple way to get a serverless function up and running and add in some monitoring. Um, thank you. Sorry, minor technical issues here. Uh, so thank you for your excellent and very fast <laughs> presentation. So I, I hope that everybody could kind of 
uh, catch on and what's happening and, and what's going on. But at least I have here one question from Per. So when you say that data is sent to Datadoc, do you mean that the customer's data is actually sent off-site to the Datadoc company service, or do you mean that the customer has deployed an instance of the Datadoc software themselves? Yeah, so, so it would be better for, for him at least, and I know for others too. Sure. So what happens, especially with the AWS integration, is that on Datadog, you have API keys that you generate um, in your um, integrations tab. And you it's a one button click. So if I want to use Amazon, I click integrate Amazon integration. It gives me a place for me to put in my uh, API key. And then it automatically syncs a lot of Amazon's content with Datadog. Yeah. So it's not, um, you're not deploying anything on Datadog at all. You're just linking up whatever integration it is that you are using for this example, it was AWS, and then all of those logs and metrics are getting forwarded over from Amazon so that you can able to create like dashboards and monitors in Datadoc. Yeah, I think that that is always the thing that uh, the, the ones who know get worried about and the ones who don't know <laughs> are not even aware of where the kind yeah. of the logging data goes and how that works. Um, so any other questions that you have for Rachel, please put them on the chat. And while we are waiting, if there happens to be any more questions, then uh, I, I think that it was really good to see your presentation in the kind of first uh, parts of the uh, event, because we've been talking so much about like, theoretically <laughs> that APIs can be used for this and microservices can use, be used for that. but. In your opinion, uh, what is the the best reason for these kind of serverless and, and microservices style of coding? Because yeah, that's I mean, what everybody's been asking here in one form or another. I think that, that microservices are a great solution for parts of a, uh, an ecosystem that don't get used all the time. So like, why would you have something, you know, having 100% uptime if it's only getting run whenever somebody needs like a uh, image to be uploaded somewhere or a message to get sent up where you can run things on a like yeah. cron job timeline. Like if I have something that only needs to get run a certain amount of times a day, there's no need, there's no need for me to have it uh, mm. you know, up 100% of the time. So you're saving server resources and you're saving money at the same time. Whenever you can take that piece of your system and compartmentalize it into something that's a lot more efficient, it's gonna speed up everything else. Like you do have to deal with a little bit more latency since it's having mm. to start up every time, but I think- yeah, it's I was going to ask problem. about the heating, <laughs> heating yeah. problem, <laughs> the preheating. Yeah, yeah, I think the trade-off is, is worth it. Yeah, because there there have been cases where, like in projects that I have been involved too, where where you have the serverless architecture and it's there exactly for the reasons that you are saying, but because of um, the the kind of very random usage of some of the services and then the expectance of like a really speedy uh, response, you you end up keeping uh, the serverless server <laughs> or the, the service alive all the time, which kind of takes out the point of the serverless yeah. <laughs> being there. One so. other use case that I think is really good for it is if you have different um, regulations between different regions that you operate in, yeah. like you're able to, you know, control uh, you know, EU deploys versus US yeah. or uh, Latin America, all those, you can send it to different data centers depending on, you know, whoever your your use case is, which mm -hmm. also saves them round trip time and then can also, you know, make less code on having to determine like, where is this person when you yeah. can actually just have them run the API that they need for where they are. I think that that is a very good point because I don't know, uh, how, do you know what a Finnish sauna is? Like a sauna, where, yeah. like a heated room, yes. So I have this joke, which is true uh, story that kind of have, do you uh, fit the Russian and the Finnish and the Swedish uh, APIs into the same sauna because you, you have to deal with the different regulations and the different uh, data requirements and latencies and everything else. And, and in those cases, 
for example, having the customer data handled in, in certain services, it makes a lot of sense to have the, the different serverless services deployed to, yep. separately. But hey, th thanks for the great talk. It was a pleasure to have you here. I know it's a bit early <laughs> for you probably at this hour, but uh, it was really nice to start with some practical stuff. Yep. So thank you, thank Rachel. You. Bye. Bye.